What's up? Welcome back to the podcast. In today's episode, we feature Coach Gerby, and Gerby is on the Haitian national team. He is a swimmer. He shares a lot of insight into how he got into coaching, his philosophy of coaching, uh, what it takes to get to the highest levels of the sport, and uh, sit back and enjoy today's episode. Let's dig in. Like individual sports like swimming, uh, yeah. swimming, golf, tennis. Um, I've been, I've never been a good swimmer, <laughs> the, I'm terrible swimming. Uh, but I've always been drawn to individual sports cause I know mm. it's, it's so mental. Um, you're, you're not really relying on other people unless you're doing like a team, uh, s- swimming. Uh, but like, I know you're, you're constantly in your head, right? Um, yeah. tell, tell us like what sort of discipline, you know, did you have when you were younger that obviously it's carried over until now? Cause I mean, you're, you're on the national team. I mean, you're in the top 1% or I mean, I would say less than 1% of athletes in the world who can achieve to that level. But how did you, I guess, where did that discipline come from when you were younger and how has that helped you now? So that's a great question. When I was younger and when I, we got our club program in my hometown when I was, I would say 15 to 16 years old. And when I enrolled into club, the way my dad put it, cause you know, every, every sport has a club, right? But the way my dad put it, he was just like, this, this is USA club. This is the way if you want to get to the Olympics. Like he didn't say, he was just like, Hey, this is year round swimming. He was just like, Hey, this program is the way that you get to the Olympics. You don't do it through middle school or high school. You, if you want to get to the Olympics and get to the top, you got to do this. I was the moment he worded it like that. I don't know why I was just like, I was all in. So I took it very seriously. Cause I was just like, in my mind, I was like, I'm trying to get to the Olympics. I want to be like a national swimmer. I, I used to always see like videos of the national swimmers from USA and all the, all stuff they got to do and travel. So that was like my goal. So from a very young age, I took that very seriously. So I did things like I, you know, made my parents only make chicken and rice for dinner almost every meal. I ate lots of veggies and fruit. I had like, I wrote down lots of stuff on a piece of paper. I had this, this piece of paper on my bulletin board as a 16 year old. And I would write today, you need to work on this in practice. And if I didn't achieve that to my standards, I didn't cross it out. I left it there. So every single day I would look at it and be like, okay, today I got to make sure I do it to my standards. And then if I worked on it enough to my standards, I'd cross it out and write the next thing. But it was just little things. It was little things like that. I never, um, I know I want to keep this PG, but I never drank or anything growing up. I never did anything. I never went to like parties or anything like that. I was, you know, we had weekend long swim meets. I went to, if I would have a a girl who would ask me a school dance on Friday or Saturday, I would go to that swim in the morning. I would come right back and get ready for the dance and go to the dance. Like, I just knew what I had to do, and I knew that it was going to be sacrifices. But I think what's interesting about that is that, in my mind, I already made the sacrifice of not being able to swim with my friends in high school and middle school. So it was all or nothing, you know? So it's like, I've already gone this far. It's already a lonely journey. No one's doing it with me. You know, why not go all in and see what happens? Right. Yeah, that's... That's awesome. And, and that's kind of what I've seen is like, I've, d- I've done a lot of these interviews with coaches over the last couple of months. Um, and the ones who just have like set priorities mm. of what they want, and they're so clear about that. It's, it's very easy for them to say no to all of the normal things that everyone else does. And, and it kind of goes back to, like, I, I've, I've read about this a lot recently where normally like high achievers are really good at spending time by themselves and Mm -hmm. working on the thing that they want to do and not needing to have others who are like cheerleading them on, uh, on a daily basis. The biggest thing is that you don't want to ask anything from your athletes that you wouldn't do or you don't do. So when I got into coaching, even when I started out coaching, I coached just eight and unders. But it was the same. Like, I'm, I'm not going to come in and say, hey, you guys need to work hard in the pool if, you know, your coach isn't a swimmer. You know, my current athletes, I'm not going to ask them to go out and run a mile if I can't show up and do it with them. Right. And, like, I am known on deck to be the guy who eats pineapples. 
because I don't want my swimmers to know that I'm I don't want them to be the guy who eats a donut. So I, I don't want my swimmers to look up and be like, my coach is being a fat person and eating all these stuff. You know, like I want to set the example because the, the moment they see the, the figure of authority doing something, they don't argue with it. They just like, Oh, he, he does it. So obviously it's, he knows what we're going through. And that's, that's the biggest thing. It's just, set, you know, preach, do what you preach. And the biggest thing after that is consistency, you know, come in every day um, and be something they know what's going to happen. Don't be, cause I know a lot of coach, I mean, swimmers will be like, my coach sometimes is, some days he comes in, he's happy. Some days he comes in, he's angry, but they're like, you, we know you come in every single day. You're happy, you're energetic, you're ready to go. And, and it, it makes, we know what to expect. So it makes it a lot easier and so I just think when you're consistent on not just your attitude, but what you preach and um, the way you just go about life, it makes it so much easier to buy in. And those are the two things that I have really used as escalated my coaching and my athletes' results um, through the years. Right. That's awesome. And how long have you been coaching? Uh, since I was, so I'm 24, so I started, started coaching when I was 17, 16. Wow. So, yeah, quite a bit. but. Those first couple of years, I, they were eight and unders and 11, 12 year old kids at summer league. So it was just like twice, like two months a year out of the year. I didn't really get into full-time coaching um, until this actual, a year ago when I started, I was head coach for my, that one club, um, Tri-West Swim Club. But yeah, this is my second major head coaching job, but yeah. That's cool. What do you feel like is the biggest challenge as, as being a coach to kids? I think it's just... Honestly, I think the biggest challenge is understanding them because I think we like to, I always tell people that kids are smart, right? Kids are very smart. And I think we underestimate how unintelligent kids can be. I think we just like to put kids in the category of they're just kids. And I think the biggest challenge sometimes with coaches is just understanding that kids can un understand what you're doing. They're not dumb. Um, and so they can sometimes milk things a lot and kind of, you know, act dramatic and get, try to trick you about whether they're feeling about a certain way, or sometimes they can just, they understand if you're, you're messing with them. They understand if you're trying to lie or to them. So I always tell people, I was like, don't treat kids like kids in sports. You got to treat them like intelligent and athletic adults because you know, most athletes are intelligent, right? They're there for a reason. They know their sport. That's the biggest thing. They're intelligent in their sport. So I think that's the biggest challenge is coming every day and remembering, oh, these kids are like, they're with it. Like they understand they're, they're smart. They're intelligent. I can have intelligent conversations with them and I can resonate with them because they understand what's going on and not just being like, oh, 11 and 12 year olds they are just 11, 12. They're dumb. They just want to go play and die, you know, so that's, that's the biggest thing I've kind of come across. Right. Yeah. I know. I know on my end, the thing that I think this took me time, just experience coaching to, to fully get this. But like once I started to realize like, wow, like I can, I can actually have a huge impact on these kids. Then I, I started to take, everything, what I said, just, I took it way more serious, how I handled myself around kids. Uh, cause I know at the beginning when I started training kids, I was just very, I don't know. It was, it was almost like, you know, they're going to show up to my session. I'm going to put them through a good workout and then that's it. And it was zero yeah. sort of like personal relationship going on, uh, between myself mm -hmm. and the clients I was working with. And over time it made me realize, you know what, like, yeah, these kids are very intelligent. They're smart. They're going to listen to everything. So you have to be very careful with what you say because like what you say can completely ruin their confidence mm -hmm. or it can build their confidence to a to an un, you know, an unshakable level. Um, yeah. I feel like coaches have the the power to be able to have that sort of influence. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, with that, man, like – the biggest challenge with that that I've come across is that children don't buy in like they used to, right? They like so many kids, when they, you ask them, why are you here? They just say, I'm here because I want to have fun or be my friends. Right. So like, right. and I know cause you run a professional elite program, right? So like how frustrating is it when you're like, I'm trying to help you be 
like a successful athlete. I, I want to win. I want you to be a winner, um, a successor and also. And like, so have somebody just be like, I don't really care. I'm just here to do this. So I've always come across cause like, like you said, swimming is an individual and team sport. So when we, let's say we're trying to win a sh- conference championship at the, the, at the end of the year, how do we get these five kids who are just here to have fun and don't really care to buy in? And that's the biggest thing. I don't know if it used to be like that, like a long time ago with kids, but man, I'm seeing it everywhere. Every kid, so many kids are just like, I don't want to go to practice. I don't want to be here. I'm just here because mom made me. Um, so just making those kids buy in trying to figure, figure out how to make their place be a good place on the team. That's positive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm definitely with you on that. I feel like the, the commitment level of a lot of kids out there has dropped over the last 10 years. And um, I don't know what I've, what I've kind of traced it back to, I, in my opinion, it's the parenting. Um, there's a lot of parents who they're all over. Like they, they want to have private training, group training they're, they're They want to invest into that sort of thing, but their kid is not at that level. Yeah. And so they're yeah. kind of being forced to do stuff and, and, I've never seen over the last 12 years of coaching kids, I've never seen one time where the kid doesn't want to be there. The parents want them to be there and the kid gets better. Like the kid never gets better. Um, yeah. if the parents are just dragging them to the session. Um, yeah. and it's, it's one of those things though. Like it's, it's very common and I found it's, it's really hard to motivate kids unless they want to be there. Um, and I feel like I don't really, I never need to motivate any of my clients at this point because they want to be there just as bad as me. And, you know, it, it makes it easy to work with kids who have that mindset, but that mindset's very, it, it's the, it's the minority of kids. Um, yes. it's tough. It's one of those tough things. Um, all right, cool, man. So you've been coaching for a while. Um, you started when you were a teenager. Um, what's, w- if you just kind of have to think back, like what's been like the most like fulfilling story you have of uh, a kid that you've worked with that's either made it to a high level or just like your favorite coaching moment? Oh man, there's so many. Um, but I have to say, so there's two. Um, but let's, so last summer when I was head coaching for my summer league, um, first year ever head coaching for that summer league, and, you know, they had the idea that it's just summer league, right? That just supposed to be fun, not take it seriously, show up whenever you want. And then here, this kid come fresh out of college, comes by, takes up the head coaching job. And I put all these rules in place and I'm like, this is how we're doing it. This is how it's going to be done. If you don't like it, there's a door. Um, and it's a while for people to really buy into that. A lot of parents got mad, but that year we broke 19 records. So, uh, and I always say like, people will just look at the 19, 19 records, but there was a, every single day, there was something amazing happening inside that pool facility that made that happen. Um, so yeah, it was really special, but the, the actual story there, the year before I became the head coach, I was the 11, 12 head coach for our team. And our girl, we had three to four girls who were like state level good. There were three girls who were state level good. They were super fast. And they, we saw them break a relay at the conference meet the year before. And I was looking at this relay and I was just, I was thinking about it. I was just like, wow, these girls broke this relay record. But if they want to break it next year, they need a backstroker. And for those who don't understand swimming, the relays go backstroke, breaststroke, butterfly freestyle. Um, and backstroke leads off, right? I was thinking about these three girls who just broke this record. I'm not even caring about the record. I'm thinking next year when they move up to my group, the 13 to 14s, they're going to need a backstroke if they want to break any break another relay record. And they don't have one that's fast enough. So I'm sitting here at the conference meet trying to think of how can we get this these three girls, a fourth girl fast enough to make this possible. So there was one girl in my mind, one girl wasn't even close. To put this in perspective, her split for the 50 back going down and back in the pool had to be a 32 at the slowest, or 33, 32, 33 at the slowest. Coming into the season, she was a 39. So I was just like, how, yeah, yeah. So I was just like, how can we make this girl go a 33 to just give them a chance? That's all she has to, but that's a big drop, a 39, 33 to 39. 
So coming into the season, I pull her aside and was like, hey, you three, you four girls, you need to go this split, you need to go this split, you need to go this split. To get, and you guys need to go these splits because this girl, uh, as, as the, the slowest she can go is a 33. She has to go 33 three at the slowest for you guys to have a chance. So those three girls are like, okay, yeah, we got it, we got it, go off. Then the fourth girl, I bring her aside, I'm like, hey, you need to be, we, at the end of the season, we need you at a 33 at the slowest. She's like, okay. She's like, okay, let's do it. So we worked really hard with this girl. She came in extra. We worked on her starts. Um, she, I kept moving closer to the faster girl. It's just, like, I kept screaming at her anytime she would slow down. Um, and it, I did, it gives me chills to this day at the conference meet that year when she let off for the relay and she split a 33 and then the other girls did their thing. They broke that record by like, I think one tenth or something like that. And it was, it was, it was so special just because every girl did their part. And that girl, she, she went in like on paper, it was impossible. Right. But she knew what she had to do. We gave her enough time to understand it and mentally grasp it and understand what she needed to do. And she did it. And she did, she did a 33 from a 39. And like to this day, when they break that, when, just think about that record. It just super emotional, but it was really cool. Dude, that is, <laughs> that is awesome. Cause they go, is it down and back? Is that right? Yep, down back, and then down back, down back, and down back for all four girls. Right. For all four consumers. Yep. Yeah. Man, that is awesome. That's yeah. really cool. <laughs> That's really, really cool. But I was, I was gonna say, but like that just I mean, anytime a swimmer needs to do something, I just that's how I coach, right? I just I look at the long term and I say, let's not let's not make our goal we need to go this. Because for example, you know, in soccer terms, if you start your season, hey, our, our goal is to win the conference championship. There's so many things that have, have to happen along the way to achieve that. So let's make our goal to be the very best that we can be every single day, and then we'll just gradually go in the right direction. If we win, we win. If we don't, at least we can say we did our best. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. I, and it's funny, before we got on this call, I was looking back at our message on Instagram, and you said something. I'm going to try to pull it up right now. I don't know if you remember this. Okay. This was Come back this. in, it was back in July. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. Yeah, you left me these two voice notes. Um, actually, I'm just going to read it if it's cool. So you said, no, I, fine. Yeah. You, go, <laughs> you go, I think it's interesting that people who watch your stuff may assume <clears throat> that your program is meant to bring hundreds of clients at once when really it's a slow but steady process because one client can be a big deal. It's a slow building block to the top. So if you get one client a week or even one client every two weeks, that's still bringing in an extra six to $800 a month. So if you continue bringing in just that one client every now and then it will add up very quickly. And then you left these two voice notes under that. And you went on to say like, you know, so many people are, are focused on just getting so many different clients at one time. Um, and the reality is like, if you just chisel away and you just go like one client at a time, they're going to have a much better experience. So tell me more about kind of what you meant by that. Like how, how has that helped you grow yeah. your coaching program? So I've always, you know, been, you know, whether it just be God's plan or what, but I've always been found finding myself coaching with the little person, the, the under the person who's underestimated or whatever. So, you know, I like to win and I always want the, I want that story in history to be the person no one saw coming to come out of nowhere and win or whatever, make all the money or something. But like, that's not realistic. If you just start out by saying, writing on the wall, Hey, today our goal is going to be to be the best ever. Mm-hmm. Right? Michael Phelps's coach didn't write on the board. Hey, Today, we're going to be the very, our goal is going to be the greatest Olympian of all time, win eight gold medals. No, like it, everything is a process, right? Um, your soccer business, bringing in income or bringing in athletes is a process. And I think what I, when I was saying that, 
is like people look at, oh, you only bring one or two athletes in uh, every couple of weeks or um, an athlete in a month. That's not a whole, that's not really big. But like those people, that's the problem. The people who think that way and the people who look at things that way miss the point because the point is the process and winning six major success or whatever reward you get at the end of the day, that's just icing on the cake. That's not even the point. The point is the process, the bit by bit step sto- stepping stone to get to getting to the top. And so with my coaching, you know, it's the same way. We just think we take it step by step. Like today, our goal is to be the very best we can be. Tomorrow, our goal is also to be the very best we can be. And then if we have a conference meet at the end of the year, okay, well, let's make our next goal to be, let's try to win as many tool meets as we can. All right, now let's make our goal to be, be the very best team we can be in the area. Okay, and now let's make our, our goal to be, let's try to beat this team that beat us last year. It, the process is the fun part if people understand that. Making, if you have a soccer business, if you have a client a week, that's a lot. That's successful. That's crazy. That's making so much money. That's making, and then, and, and you taking finances out of it. That's making a kid's life, like improving a kid's life one kid a week. And that's incredible too. Right. So next thing you know, every week you're impacting someone's life for the better. So like, that's just all I mean by is people think that the end product is the point. In my point, in my opinion, the end product is icing on the cake. The process is what makes sports fun. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. And, uh, it's one of, I think it's one of the biggest reasons why people who think long-term they, I mean, they always succeed. Like, I've never met yeah. someone who thinks long-term that has failed, especially with business. Um, because they know it's not, it's not what's the end result today. It's they're building on top of what they did yesterday. And it's just one consistent brick at a time. And I can trace back, like I look at coaches that we've been able to help over the past five years, like the ones who I would say on paper that are the most successful, they're the ones who just have stayed the most patient and persistent Mm -hmm. over a longer period of time than someone else who doesn't. Um, And it's the same thing, man. It's, it, it goes hand in hand. Just if you look at your career as a swimmer, it's like, you're not going to, you're not going to be on the national team when you're eight years old. (laughs) It's going to take you years to figure it out, years to get better. Um, And one of the questions I like to ask people, because no one has the same answer here, but like, what's your definition of success? Oh, I love that you asked me that because we literally went over, I went over this with my athletes like two weeks ago. So everyone always says that, you know, you need to be successful. You know, coaches tell you you need to be successful. Parents, sorry, I don't mean to call parents out, but they always tell their kids you need to be successful. Um, and then, so what happens is that we, we as a society think that success is a standard that we need to meet. But in reality, success is a standard and something in values that you make for yourself. Because the problem is people are getting expectations mixed up with like, standards. What they say you need to be successful and they say that, that's just expectations. That's not success. When they say you need to win this game to be successful, that's not, that's not what success is. That's their expectations and that's standards they're setting for you. What success is at the end of the day is you saying, I need to accomplish this and I want to do it. And I need and me putting every single thing I can into that thing. And if I do that, then that's successful. So like, for example, when I was in college, I'm not even, I'm not afraid about it. I was terrible at math. I barely passed math to graduate, but, and some people were to look at that and say, Hey, Gary, if you, Gary, you need to get a B to be successful so you can be, have successful grades. Well, in my opinion, I need to be, I just need to pass a class so I can graduate. And that, in my opinion, that's success because I'm trying every single thing I can. I'm putting in hours of studying to do this. And at the end of the day, I'm only getting D's, but if I'm trying the very best I can, and my, my goal is just to graduate and get past this class, then how can you define that that's my success? How can you look at me? How can you tell me that that's not successful enough? Because at the end of the day, if you're putting out everything in and that's your goal and you achieve it, then that's success. Standards and expectations are not mixed with success. That's just 
people mix those two together all the time. And I think that just, it's upsetting because so many kids now are not loving sports and they're not loving school. Or they're not loving what they're doing. And same with people, older people too, because people are saying, Hey, you need to do this to be successful. Right. But that's not it. That's just, you need to do this because that's what I think you should do or that I think you need to do, you know, it's expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's the quickest way to be miserable is to try to meet other people's expectations. Um, yeah. Because, because at that point, like, I mean, especially like if you just had to break down money, let's say, let's just use money as an example. Like, you're always going to find someone who's going to make more money than you. Like, yeah. Because the higher up you go, like, you're going to keep finding people that are doing better. Um, and then, you know, wh- whatever you're doing, you might feel like that's not good enough because that's what they're doing. And then yeah. everybody has, has this thing in their, their brain where they're like, oh, well, I want to do what that person's doing. And then, you know, they, don't, they either don't know what it takes to get there or it's going to mm-hmm. be a very rough go for them to get there because, you know, it's not something that they want. It's something that they see that someone else has. And, and exactly. I know with, with kids, it's, it's, it's very slippery slope because um, they might see another kid who's better than them and get jealous and not, not go down the same path. They're, they're, they're not going to be willing to work as hard. They just, you know, get envious. And, and so many adults are like that too. Like I see it all the time um, with coaches that financially they want to do better, but they want to do better just because of other people's expectations. It has nothing to do with what they want. Yeah. Um, and I think I like, I like your channel and I like your videos because you, you do a really good job at that where you're just like, Hey, some of these people might not like what I have to say, or what some of these people might not like my ideas. And that's okay. But you're like, that's okay. But you make it very clear that you're doing what you're doing because it's what you want to do. Or you're saying what you're saying because it's what you want to say. You're not basing it off of what people want to hear or want to say or want to do. You know, it's you, it's your originality, it's your uniqueness that make you who you are. So like, that's exactly, that's a perfect, perfect example to follow. And that's, I think that's why I enjoy watching your stuff because you're just like, you're like, this is me. If you don't like it, that's okay. Cause this is me. This is what I set for myself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One, <laughs> one thing I, one thing I've realized is like, if a hundred, if I take a hundred percent of people who watch my stuff, I'm so cool. If 99.9% of them don't like me, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, because <laughs> Cause it, it's so easy to not like someone online. Like it, it could be for any reason. And I know for me, like the only thing I care about is if I say something that I feel like can help, like if it can help one person that day, I've done my job. Um, there's, there's really nothing else I care about with the content that, that we put out. Um, uh, because you know, it's, it's so easy, especially on social media to try to go down this rabbit hole of getting the most likes or, or having the most views or just being some guru or whatever it is. Um, and I, again, it, it kind of goes back to the expectations that we talked about. It's like, it's like, who are you trying to be? Are you, are you doing this to actually help people? or Are you trying to do this to be liked? And I don't know, for me, like I'm married, I have probably two friends outside of (laughs) my marriage. Like, I live a very simple life. I, I don't need to have any, any buddies. Um, and that's just kind of how I've been. Uh, cool, man. Now I appreciate that. Been the biggest lesson that you've learned since COVID. I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is that there are no excuses. Um, and I, 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 I don't want to say that, you know, and just like completely not acknowledge the struggles everyone's gone through, but like, in reality, we live in a society where everything is possible some way, virtually, electronically, whatever, you know, um, even like working out. Like, so like, for example, I'm an athlete, I, all the gyms and all the pools were closed. You know, I could have just sat by and just said like, Oh, whoa, it's me. And I can't go to the pool or I could have gone out and played pickleball for five hours and worked out. Like there, there really isn't any excuse. And it comes to my athlete, to my team for a while, we weren't doing anything because like I said, the pools were shut down and I'm just like, no, let's, I was like, let's just, let's go meet up at the park and let's just do morning two hour workouts. So I started doing that. Um, 
obviously businesses are finding a way around it. Everyone's finding a way to do some, there's a way to do anything you want to do um, during COVID. It just, it just takes time to realize it. So that was definitely my biggest thing. Cause there were definitely, there was definitely like a month or a half to two months where I was kind of just not doing working out as much. I just kind of like thought that because everything was closed down that I couldn't do anything. And I would just realize that there's no excuses, no excuses to accomplish your goals. There are no excuses not to get things done. You know, I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. I still have connections. I still have people that look up to me and need to hear from me. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to shut down. I'm not going to step down and let this take over my life because you know, if you're a role model, if you're a figure, if you're somebody that, that helps others and you need to continue to be that beacon of hope because there's already so much hope like gone. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and it, it stems perfectly with what you said at the beginning about, you know, being that kind of like that role model to kids. Like if, if you're going to ask them to go run a mile, you should be able to run a mile. <laughs> right. And yeah. I know that's, that's kind of the thing that I've noticed as far as like what's happened in the last four or five months is kids really need leaders. And when they can look up to a coach like yourself and be like, you know what? I want to be like him. Um, those coaches who kind of stepped up during this time, they became resourceful with, you know, what was available. Those are the ones who are still yeah. having that sort of impact on kids. And I know a lot of coaches during this time kind of just went into a shell. Um, and so if, if you're a coach watching this right now and you're listening to this, I, you should use this as an opportunity to step up and actually make a difference versus just hide. And um, yeah, I, I, I feel like kids right now, they need more leadership, I think, than ever. We, we waited for things to get a little bit better before we went to the park workouts. But that, that month before, we're doing dry land over Zoom. So yeah, definitely, you know, like, like you said, kids are – kids need people right now to be helping them, you know, whether it be physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, they need that presence. So don't, don't hide and don't just wait for things to blow over. Cause like you said, one of your videos, you know, we don't know when this is going away. It might never go away. So. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm, I have it in my head. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but I have it. I am pretending that it's never going away like that it's just going to be this ongoing thing and if it gets better awesome if it doesn't i'm going to operate the exact same way i am and and not let it you're always ready just not let it affect me uh mentally because it's it's very easy to fall in the trap of like well you know all these restaurants have closed blah 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 and it's mm -hmm. like you know you can't can't control what you can't control um and yeah. you know you can you can absolutely be resourceful during this time. The thing that for fulfills me is just making, well, it's two things. One is seeing just the, the look on kids' face when they do something special. But the biggest thing, the all around thing, man, is just making good people, you know, making, taking a kid who's maybe been troubled and just bringing them in and just seeing them at the end of, you know, end of the season, just happy, just smiling all the time. Cause like I coach, cause yeah, I, I, I'm pretty good at swim, coaching swimming and teaching people how to swim. I get that. But a lot of coaches are good at that, right? What coaches lack is the connection with making athletes, you know, making athletes good people, making athletes like you and all that stuff. So just, just seeing people just change, just seeing them enjoy their lives with people, um, seeing them understand, understanding right from wrongs, um, you know, I, I, I talk, I give a little daily talk between every, before every practice. And it's always something not related to swimming. It's always about being a good person, being a good role model, being a good son or daughter, making sure you're think, think your parents, making just all the little stuff so that when they come to practice, they're not just learning how to be good swimmers. We want to make good athletes and we want to make good people. So just being able at the end of the year for, to see a kid just being like, Hey, I just, I'm, thank you for teaching me how to be a good person. That's means more to me than people saying, Hey, thank you for helping me swim fast. Right. That's really cool, man. Yeah. And I, I shared this on a, on a video a long time ago, but I think the most, one of the most impactful people I ever had in my life was when I was around 12 or 13. And 
Mm-hmm. Uh, he was he was the best soccer trainer I ever had, but it wasn't about how good of a coach he was. Like he knew yeah. how to connect with me on a level that like I never had beyond that. Like I mean it was it was amazing how much how much confidence that coach gave me at that age when I really desperately yeah. needed it. Um, and you know, that's, I, I can look back at it and be like, man, like it would have been very difficult for me to start a business or go play college soccer or do, do the things that I did if I didn't have a coach who was like that. So you're, you're in an awesome position, man, to be helping these kids, not only just develop and, and be awesome swimmers, but to, to really help them become incredible humans, which I feel like is one of the things that's going to make you different over the next 10 to 20 years as you progress with your career in swimming. And uh, just want to say, man, keep up the great work. It's really cool to connect with someone like you who, who genuinely cares about kids. I've thought about this a lot uh, because I know on YouTube that the videos I put out a lot, a lot of the content is for coaches that haven't started a business and I'm going away wow. from, from that model, um, in the future <laughs> where it's for people who already have a business that already have clients that they're working with. But like, do you think everyone's cut out to start a business? Um, no, I don't think so. And the reason I think that is because, um, I don't think people realize how hard managing a business is. It's a full-time job. You know, people think that with coaching, for example, think people think that, Oh, they they always say, Oh, you get paid just to go to the pool for a couple hours. I'm like, no man, like I'm up at like six or seven and I am doing coaching. Like it might not be physically coaching, but I'm doing coaching stuff all the way till practice. Then I'm coaching at practice for like four to six hours. Then I'm coming home and, and analyzing results and stuff. And then even on Sundays I'm doing work. So if you like, that's people just think that it's just, it's just, Oh, super easy. So I guess like my thing is just like, like starting a business, starting a job, anything like that, a full-time business, it is going to be harder than having like, you know, a job working for somebody else. Right. But that's, that goes back to what I said earlier that that's why it's worth it because it's your baby and you love it. And it's something that's you and you started it and it's something you're passionate about. Like for example, I've started, I'm starting a small little side business. Um, I call it side business because it's kind of a nonprofit, but I, you know, I go all in with it. I'm doing stuff with that all the time, every single day, every day. And it's super, super hard. It is tiring emotionally, physically, mentally. It's super hard. So people need to understand that. And I think that's why it's smart to kind of maybe get a mentor or kind of just job shadow and just get an idea of it first before you just wake up one day and be like, I'm going to do this. Um, some people are successful at it. Some people aren't, but just to get an idea, because I think the demands, the, there's a lot more demands than people that, that don't, don't get advertised and that people realize. I'm sure you can attest to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's funny, like the perception, I, I think there's a mixed perception of, of coaches who uh, have a business or they're, they have a coaching career. Like from the outside looking in, it's like, oh, that's pretty easy. Like they probably sleep in and they just show up to practice. Uh, yes. And, you know, they're probably just watching, you know, Netflix during the day. And the reality is people can do that. Um, probably won't be successful doing that. <laughs> um, but, but I see like you have to, you have to treat it like, like you're on a mission. That, that's kind of, that's when I wake up, I know that, you know, no one's going to tell me to come into the office to, to be in this room, you know, making videos or talking to coaches, do, do whatever the tasks I, I have to do during the day. And, you know, it, I've always looked at people who make rash decisions. Like you've probably seen this. I mean, you probably don't do this because you're super fit, but a lot of people, when they're at the grocery store, they're about to check out, they see the the Snickers bar and the M&Ms. They're like, Oh, I'm just going (laughs) to grab it. And then they throw it on on the the thing. They, they pay $2 for it, whatever it is. And a lot of people treat business that way. They're like, 
they'll be like, oh, I want to do that. And then they have no. no idea, no clue about what it takes. And I, I would say for anyone who's very committed, like they are, they're a very committed type of person. That's the type of person that generally succeeds. Um, but people who yeah. jump from shiny object syndrome to the next <laughs> shiny object, like those people, I, I feel like are destined to fail just because they, they don't have the type of sacrifice and discipline. Um, even you just said it too. You're looking to start something on the side and I'm sure it's grueling doing that plus what you're currently doing. I mean, it's a lot, man. Yeah, only my last message for that is don't ever start something just because somebody else, like you saw something and it like got you all excited and you were like, you know, I want to do that because what happens is there's a thing that I, I've come up with is like called like the starting a business or starting idea high. And eventually people come off of that high. And when you come off of that high, you become unmotivated. So in the very beginning, you're like, Oh, this is a really good idea. I'm going to do this and this. You start doing all this stuff. You're really busy. And then when things slow down, when things start getting less productive, when you get less invested, suddenly nothing's happening and you're getting you're off that high, that excitement's gone. So that's why I go back to my original thing saying you have to be emotionally, spiritually invested and love it. So when you're off that high and things aren't kicking off the ground and going crazy businesses and booming anymore, maybe you're, you started ice cream business and now it's December, you have to have, you have to still want to be motivated to find ways to be successful or your mm -hmm. business will fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And one of my mentors, he, he commonly, he always says the winter's coming. He always says that. And all, <laughs> I like that. All, all he means is like, you, you have to constantly put yourself in, in, in the state of mind where it's like, you know what? Like it doesn't matter how good things are right now. And it doesn't matter how bad things are right now. It's like, you have to operate with the same level of intensity um, and you have to be so like just incredibly disciplined to do things that you don't want to do. Cause it's like, there's so many times and I have zero problem sharing this, but there's so many times where I don't want to shoot videos. I'm just like, that's the last thing I want to yeah. do today. <laughs> um, and I actually hate shooting videos, <laughs> even though I've at this point <laughs> have uploaded over 700 something videos to YouTube on, on two different channels. And it's like, yeah. you know, but it, it comes down to, well, why do I want to do it? And that goes back to what you said. It's like when you are clear on why in the world you want to do something, then you're going to do it. Like you're, you're not going to make excuses and you're just going to step up when, when you need to do it. And, you know, nothing will get in your way. Uh, cool, man. Well, I really appreciate uh, you staying on a little bit longer than, than I know we planned. Uh, but is there anything else you want to add? Like, uh, any sort of tip or, or advice you would give coaches who are looking to start? It goes back to the process, you know, the process is what matters. So just have all those steps in line. And if you ever have a day or a moment where you don't have a step, you need to stop and just take the time to think of it. Don't move forward without it. Cause you're going to look back and be like, dang, I really wish I would have thought about this more mm -hmm. before I moved on. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Great advice. That's awesome. Cool, man. Well, yeah, I appreciate you jumping on here and, and sharing your wisdom. And I'd love to have you come back on here uh, maybe six to 12 months from now.